this is a time series over 25, uh, 25 years, from 1990 uh, to 2015, that shows that alternative assets, by that I mean private equity, hedge funds, real estate, uh, re uh, natural resources, and et cetera. The allocations of that have been substantially increasing, essentially, and uh, public equity allocations uh, are, are decreasing, and of course, cash and fixed income have gone way down. Uh, just to make sure this is a robust result, whether you cut this, uh, so this is a university endowment uh, uh, sample. So if you just cut this between public and private universities, the same thing holds. If you cut it based on the size of uh, the endowment funds, um, you see a little bit of variations, perhaps. But uh, by and large, the, the direction uh, uh, is robust, which is allocations to alternatives um, have gone way up. Okay? As you can see, as you probably would expect, large uh, endowment funds tend to have uh, a lot bigger allocation percentage-wise okay, compared to uh, smaller endowments. Okay, so these are sort of stylized facts. Um, now, I just went and checked the uh, Columbia and Yale, slightly outdated, but, uh, and I pulled out one of the community college. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so uh, what you can see is that the standard sort of 60-40 uh, allocation rule holds for small endowments, okay? They're only in public equity and uh, uh, fixed income cash. And for Columbia, Yale, just pick two examples, um, you know, you, you can see that they're heavily exposed to uh, pri uh, private equity, hedge funds, real estate, natural resources, okay? Now, again, just to make sure you are really convinced in case you don't see this, if I just sort based on the top, uh, the bottom ten de decile and the top decile, okay, the first column and last column, you see that public equity has gone down, you know, is 60% is, 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 uh, is 60 for the bottom decile and 32% for the top uh, decile size-wise. And you can see that it's, of course, uh, it's a huge crowding out effect, especially on uh, fixed income and cash, okay? And of course, alternatives have gone way up, as you can see, okay? Uh, when you increase the size of the uh, endowment on average, okay? So what do we want to do in this paper? Very, very straightforward, okay? We ask the following questions, okay? What is the optimal asset allocation for long-term investor, think about university endowments, given illiquid alternative investment opportunities, okay? Now, how do we explain the cross-sectional variations? At least I want you to think about this uh, from a conceptual perspective, okay? Uh, in terms of the asset allocation and spending strategies, why do they differ so much? Uh, obviously, that depends on investors' preferences, it depends on their uh, uh, investment opportunities. Okay, so we're going to parameterize the model uh, in the pretty parsimonious way, but try to capture the, you know, the key ideas that I think uh, are out there. Um, and of course, uh, we care how much you know uh, investors will do, uh, uh, how well they do, you know, if if they invest this way or, or alternative ways. Okay, so these are pretty much uh, um, standard questions uh, from portfolio choice perspective, and this is what the paper is about. Okay, the related literature, of course, is is just enormous, right? So of course we go back to Merton, Samuelson, and Markowitz, uh, and of course this is about alternative investments. Uh, we're going to say a little bit about that. And, uh, you know, in the theme of this conference, um, it's about, you know, linking academic research with, uh, with practice, and uh, in particular, we're going to talk about the endowment model more specifically, okay? So, okay, let's go back to uh, Asset Allocation 101. Now, this is what we teach our MBA students, for example, right? So, how would you allocate in a world where you get to choose between public equity, okay? Think about this as a diversified market portfolio and risk-free asset. Well, if you just do the standard Merton uh, Samuelson uh, uh, portfolio allocation, here's what you're going to get. You take the risk premium, let's call it 6%, and the volatility of equity markets, call it 15, 20%, and the risk version, the standard numbers seem to be between two and five, depending who you talk to, but anyway, we're gonna stick to two and a half, just to run it up so we get a very nice 60, 40 allocation rule. Why? Because that's what's often quoted in practice. So the way I teach my students is to say, look, where, where's the 60, 40 from? What's from Merton and Samuelson asset allocation uh, uh, strategy, which is optimal uh, uh, in the model uh, that they wrote down. Okay, so uh, just make sure we are on the same page in terms of the main features of the endowment model. Not everybody agrees with every feature uh, on, on the screen, but I think it's a sort of like pretty good first pass, okay? Um, this is often attributed to David Svensson uh, at Yale, who's been managing uh, Yale endowments for probably uh, endowment for over 30 years, I guess. Uh, okay, so well, one is investing in equities. Uh, the other big idea is diversification and uh, uh, with exposures to illiquids. 
Um, and he emphasizes, or, or the profession emphasizes quite a bit on what they call the value add, not financial engineering, not market timing. Uh, they try to seek opportunities in less efficient markets. The idea there is that alpha or some sort of risk adjusted excess return is more likely to happen, of course, in less efficient markets. Um, and they, they use a lot of asset managers, especially the Yale uh, version of the model, right? Where they delegate a lot, they have a lean office, and then uh, they have a lot of professional managers out there. Okay. Um, all right, so now let me just dive into the model, okay? And I'm gonna, the philosophy is very uh, straightforward, as you will see. I'm gonna keep a balance between parsimony and realism, okay? I'm gonna put the features that are absolutely essential to th get to the uh, uh, question as a first pass. I'm gonna leave out a bunch of features that I think are actually important, but we're sort of adding on uh, uh, over time, okay? But let me just give you the, the main, the main uh, features of the model as we always start, right? So we start with the Merton Samuelson environment. What do we do? We have a fixed income claim with constant rate of return R. We have public equity. For now, I'm just gonna assume that returns IID, okay? So think about mu S as the aggregate stock market return. So risk premium 6% means that you add 6% on top of the risk-free rate R, okay? And then we're gonna just write down one factor model here just to keep things simple, not because I don't think it's a multi-factor world. Again, just keep the number of state variables down, okay? So then we're gonna use the Sharpe ratio, which is the excess return divided by volatility. Okay, and it's gonna be constant Sharpe ratio world uh, for public equity. Okay, alternative uh, assets. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so again, I want the simplest possible model here. So what do I do? I wanna write on a, uh, a return process uh, where, um, uh, uh, you know, if, let, let's call A the fundamental value. I'll be more specific down the road. So think about this as a so, sort of, some sort of fundamental value measure. It's gonna be IID. Now I intentionally separate out mu A and delta A. Why? Because I need one way for illiquid alternatives to return cash back to investors. Okay, so delta A, think about this as a payout yield. Okay, so at the per unit of time, the payout will be delta A per times the, uh, the, the, the size of A, okay? And the sigma A will be the volatility. Now, of course, public equity and alternatives are correlated, but the correlation is definitely not one. So, of course, one thing you get by investing in alternative assets is you get this diversification benefit, okay? So I'm gonna just use rho to denote the correlation. Very simple, right? So three, uh, uh, three asset, uh, assets. Okay, so now let me define so because it's a one-factor model, so think about this hypothetically, okay? So if you can run a regression, okay? So leaving measurement issue, data issue aside, just think about this conceptually. If you could run a regression of alternative asset on the public market, uh, okay, stock market, and then you get this beta coefficient. So we're gonna call that beta A, oh, it should be beta A, um, is, the, uh, is the regression coefficient, right? So, so it's, it's, it's the span of volatility, which is the numerator, divided by the stock market volatility, okay? Now I'm just gonna mechanically define alpha as the uh, CAPM benchmarked uh, alpha, okay? So it doesn't really mean it's scale, okay? Just be totally clear, it's basic, it could be the liquidity premium, it's what it is, it's the definition, okay? If you think about, you know, you give to some really uh, talented managers who work really hard on the optimal contract and collect excess returns for you, you know, some sort of venture capital investment or things like that, you know, that would be fine too. So it's just a mechanical definition at this stage. Okay? So that's what we mean by alpha. Okay. Now, it's important to, add, to separate out the total volatility uh, at the uh, 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 alternative asset level, okay, into two components. One, the span, that is the part that's correlated with the market, and there's a part that's N-spanned, okay? So it's very simple, you do the, you know, a variance, uh, variance uh, additivity, right? So you take the total variance, you subtract the, uh, the systematic component of the variance, uh, you square root of that, so that's epsilon. So epsilon, so two parameters are gonna be absolutely crucial to the model's predictions, okay? One is alpha, one's epsilon. So you can think about loosely, uh, you can think about this as, um, or intuitively, alpha is the benefit and epsilon is the cost, okay? of allocating to illiquids. So we have a, we have a trade off to some extent, okay? Is that, is that clear? By the way, these are all net of fees, okay? So leaving aside the, 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 the compensation because alpha should be net of fees, okay? Uh, all right, so okay, so now here comes the key feature, right? So what do we mean by illiquid alternative investment? I'm gonna go with a very, very simple model. In my view, this, at least this is what, what I can come up with as simple as it can ever be. So, so here's the idea. 
So there are two ways you can return capital back to investors. One is you have this, remember this delta A, which is a flow variable, right? So flow parameter, so it happens continuously. So it's like constant payout rate. So imagine that Yale has a big allocation to uh, venture capital, right? Venture capital invest, uh, uh, GPs do provide uh, you know, uh, cash uh, distributions to, 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 to EL. And you think about this as the aggregate re, uh, payout yield uh, from all the uh, alternative asset back to the limited partner, okay? So that would be one. And there is another form of uh, uh, liquidity, which I also call automatic liquidity. These liquidity are automatic in a sense. You don't need to pay anything. Why? Because the, the fund matures, right? So the, 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 the GP writes you a check, say, here, here's how, uh, how, how much you earn. And there's another form, which is that the fund matures, for example, right? The private equity fund that uh, you know, the LP is in matures. At that point, you don't actually have to uh, you know, uh, put your money back you know, uh, into the same fund. You can redeploy that. And, uh, but that liquidity is, uh, is, is, uh, is lumpy. So that's delta sub T, where the cap T stands for the, the lockup period. You think about that way as approximation for that. Okay, so that w these two are the, these are the two forms of automatic liquidity events. Okay, now what else can you rebalance your uh, 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 holding of your illiquid asset? Well, one is you actually go and uh, um, liquidate certain positions. Think about financial crisis, right? There was uh, there was a secondary market for uh, for you know portfolio company uh, 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 for invest uh, the, the fund investments, right? among LPs, right? So think about this, you can liquidate before the, 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 your investment matures, okay? Another way is that you, of course, you can buy more illiquid assets, you can go just acquire. So DL is uh, liquidation, so that will reduce your total uh, illiquid asset A holding, and of course acquisition will increase that. By the way, the notation is everything that's in red means negative, okay? In, in terms of uh, uh, driving the A going down, okay? And the blue is gonna increase the holding of A. Make sense? Just so that you get the signs right. Okay, so, so these are essentially uh, four ways, I guess, um, to, 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 to change your a, uh, asset holding A beyond sh pure shocks, okay? All right, so now here's the uh, uh, slide with two uh, accumulation equations. Just make sure every penny is accounted for. Now, obviously, it's not surprising at all that you gotta keep track of liquid asset and illiquid asset. So W is liquid, that stands for wealth. Illiquid A stands for alternative, right? So you just make sure everything's added up. Now the theta L and theta X add acquisition and, dis uh, and the, uh, liquidation cost, right? If you wanna you know, uh, get rid of one of your illiquid asset holding, the chance is you're gonna take a haircut, okay? It's gonna be uh, subject to a discount. So that will be captured by theta L, that's why it's in red. And of course, if you buy a, a, an asset or if you get into a new partnership, okay, with another new GP, you know, you may do dil due diligence or search cost or you know, uh, various other transaction costs, that's gonna be theta x, okay? And uh, just be clear, m cap t, so the idea is that we're gonna have uh, the following structure, which is every cap t years, think about six years for now, okay? Every six years, uh, the fund uh, has automatic liquidity events, and, but throughout the life of the, uh, uh, of the uh, investor, you can generate liquidity as well, so that's why there's an indicator function in both dynamic processes, okay? So this is just to make sure we know the two state variables. So I want you to think about the following, which is, you know, there's gonna be a, in addition to the standard risk return trade-off, right? Another important trade-off is how much liquidity uh, exposure you want, right? So this ratio uh, between W and A will be critically important for the model. Okay, the entire model essentially uh, uh, rests on that, okay? Now let me talk about the preferences, okay? Uh, this is the generalization of the version you may have seen, okay? And uh, uh, you know, I sent to my discussant Thomas only two weeks ago with the new results, so uh, apology in advance. Okay, so why do I want to do that? It's not because, you know, asset prices know this is doable. Whenever you have a power utility model, it doesn't really cost you much to do Epstein's in. But the reason we're doing this particular preference is that I want to emphasize the distinction between gamma and EIS per si. And there's a very good economics uh, uh, that I want to emphasize towards the end of uh, my presentation. Okay, so I'll just stay tuned there. But just make sure everybody's on, uh, on the same page. So you can have three parameters describing the investor's preferences, okay? So one is how much uh, impatience, that's zeta, okay? And of course, you also have the standard risk version, which is just a risk attitude. And also you have 
how much you are willing as an investor to swing your consumption over time. And that turns out to be, I think, very important for institutional investors, okay? For example, we tend, as a first cut, you te we tend to think pension funds have more, you know, uh, have less flexibility than compared with endowments or maybe even sovereign wealth funds or, or family offices where spending is a much more uh, flexible to some extent at least compared to pension funds. Right. So anyway, so, so we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna use these uh, uh, variations to tease out very different investment and spending policies, okay? Okay, so just, this is just a technical version of what you saw on the last slide. Okay, so in the interest of time, let me just move on. Uh, 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 so this is the optimization problem. So basically, uh, okay, so, so here's, here's what's gonna happen. Um, now, utility function, value function is in units of euros. That's not all that useful to convey to practitioners. So what I want to do is convert that into what we call certainty equivalent wealth, which is if you had to give away all your entire investment opportunity, just move into the uh, world where, you know, let's say Merton Samuelson holds, now how much money do you want? So that's going to be capital P. Okay, of course, depends on liquid wealth, illiquid uh, asset holding, and time to, uh, the little t is the count of the time, okay? And then the, the B1s, V1s, don't worry, they're the standard Merton uh, con constants. Okay, so what do I need to focus in the interest of time? I want to think about illiquidity liquidity ratio, which is how much you, you are in the public equity and bonds versus how much you're in illiquids, that's gonna matter, okay? And uh, important concept is gonna be the marginal value of liquidity, the little PW. I'm gonna, in other words, if I give you a dollar more liquid asset, how much do you value? Accountants will say one, that's not true in a, in a model, okay? So uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna just skip this, okay? Um, you have interesting consumption policy rule where the highlighted parts are deviations from uh, Merton. And uh, uh, um, anyway, um, okay, so here are the parameter values. I did, you know, these are not randomly picked the parameters. They are, uh, we have details in the paper to talk about how we uh, calibrate them. But anyway, uh, I'm happy to talk more about this if you're interested. But let me just sort of, because I want to connect this to what people do, so let's think about what we mean by net worth, which is mechanically adding up your liquid and illiquid wealth holding. Of course, that's not the sufficient state variable because W's and A's are very different. But nonetheless, we're going to plot everything against this ratio, which is called um, allocation to alternatives divided by total net worth, little z. I'm going to plot that, okay? So in the interest of time, let me focus on things that I think are most, uh, sorry, uh, interest, uh, in interesting. Uh, these are rebalancing boundary. Okay, so because you have uh, acquisition and liquidation costs, so rebalancing, so, you ha so the solution features some sort of range, okay? There's a really big range where op uh, allocations can be optimal. It's really path dependent. But in the interest of time, uh, let me, um, okay, so, so when you set up your portfolio at time zero, right, so what you want to do, you want to sort of essentially trade off the liquidity diversification uh, as well as risk uh, return uh, trade-off, okay? So that's what the picture says. Horizontal axis is the uh, allocation to illiquids uh, out of your total portfolio. The vertical axis is how well you do, okay? Uh, that's, of course, a, 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 you know, a, a well-behaved function. Okay, now let me just spend the rest of the time to talk about what do you expect to get, okay, the, the, the results. Now, the highlighted, the black row is what we call the baseline. So you can see here with the reason, with somewhat reasonable parameter values, what you get is it's not that hard, actually. If you think about 2 to 3% allocation to illiquids, uh, 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 alpha, to generate something between 34 to 60% allocation to alternatives, it's, which is more or less what people do. And of course, it comes at the cost of crowding out fixed income and uh, 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 public equity. Okay, so that's alpha effect. Now, uh, let me speak at that. And the unspent volatility, I said, this is huge. It turns out this is a very, very sensitive uh, parameter, okay? If you, in other words, if your vol unspent vol is low, Alternatives look great, but if, you are, if unspent vol is somewhat high, it doesn't look that great. You look at 25 versus five, the difference is humongous, okay? Uh, risk aversion has a very, very large effect, okay? That's probably what you would expect. You know, the baseline model is, you know, you put 30, about a 30 in alternatives, and if your risk aversion doubles, it goes down to 17%. Uh, Okay, so EIS, I want to spend a, a minute on this because I find this quite intriguing. You know, the standard Merton model, say Duffy Epstein showed in the RFS paper, if you do that with a uh, uh, Merton environment with Epstein's in, you get nothing uh, from EIS on a portfolio choice because there is a separation result. Here you see it's not true. Now, well, the most striking result is that the higher the EIS, the, the much, much more flexible your spending is. If you look at the sort of the upper 
range value, like two, your spending is like 1.4%, okay? But if you look at your low EIS case, like Bob Hall's number, for example, it's gonna be spending is gonna be 6%. Very significant variation. Now because you have, when you have, you know, think about pension funds, uh, more like 0.1 perhaps. Think about uh, family office going to the other extreme, more like two or one. So you can see that, you know, which, which you do see that, you know, family office is a lot more aggressive to, to, to e-liquids, because why? Because their spending is very flexible. They can do a lot more on e-liquids. That's what you see in asset allocation range, right? So you can see the alternatives goes from 34 to 50% from the black line to the blue line. Okay, so the bunch of extensions we actually have, and some are in the paper, some are not, but let's leave this all out because I want to finish on time. Uh, now, let me just sort of set, uh, wrap everything up, okay? So it's, it's not meant to be a, uh, you know, in, uh, everything all in model. It's meant to be a parsimonious enough model, but try to capture first order issues involving endowments, okay? And so we build our modern portfolio theory. We take illiquid alternative assets seriously. We model illiqui illiquidity in like four ways. And, uh, and then we provide one um, a mod a formal model that's essentially, in my view, captures at least in terms of heavy exposure aspect to alternatives, okay? And uh, basically what we're, what we're finding is that you know, preference he heterogeneity matters hugely. Alpha and epsilon matter hugely. That's more or less, I think, would be consistent with your prior, right? So what would matter? Alpha, okay? Uh, volatility, unspent, epsilon, right? And what, what, what are the other preference parameters? It gotta be something like risk version, which is hardly surprising. But more interestingly, as I said earlier, which is the EIS result, which is for invest, long-term investors who can really swing their consumption back and forth, they are really uh, more naturally suited for, uh, for exposures to e-liquids, holding everything else constant, okay? Uh, so uh, it's not one size fits all. You know, remember the, uh, the community college example versus the others. So let me stop here.